Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to well-being, COVID, business continuity, crisis management, anything that's relatable to those topics, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free to reach out to LinkedIn. I am the only Alex Fullock on LinkedIn, so I'm really easy to find. Just send me a message and I'll reach out and we'll see about getting you on the show or maybe finding someone else to come on the show to talk about the topic you'd like to hear about. A couple of announcements. I am speaking at a couple of conferences later in 2021, October 4th to 6th at the Continuity Insights Conference in Minneapolis. November 3rd to 4th, I am part of the BCI World Virtual Conference. And December 1st to 2nd, I'm at the Continuity and Resilience Today Conference just down the road in Toronto. Fingers crossed, borders are open and I can travel. Otherwise, we'll all be talking uh, virtually. Now, I've talked about topics and being a guest on the show. And some of you may know a previous guest, Dr. Gabriel Schneider. He and I have recorded a few episodes now. He suggested that I reach out to somebody and have them come on the show uh, because uh, it was an interesting topic. And I'm glad I did because I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what my guest has to say today on the topic of workplace violence or occupational violence and aggression. And I'm going to ask him what the difference is in all of that. But I'd like to welcome to the show, Joe Saunders. Joe, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's always nice to be on the other side of the mic. <laughs> well, feel free to test me as you go along too. You know, just just if you need that moment to feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll just freeze on you and stop talking and see what you do. Yeah, that's it. Oh, oh, you wouldn't want to do that. I, I pull out a top hat and cane and start dancing. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding for anybody who thinks that's true. Uh, <laughs> Joe, uh, can you take a minute or two and tell us about yourself and how you got into what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I guess starting at the present day, I'm the national practice lead for occupational violence and aggression for for risk to solution, uh, which is obviously uh, Dr. Gav's company. Uh, I've been working with the company for about three years now. Uh, very very close relationship with, with Dr. Gav, and, and always nice that he uh, that he recommends me to people like yourself. But uh, uh, I really specialize in dealing with angry and violent people, or, or rather, helping regular people that hopefully aren't angry and violent all the time, uh, be able to manage the behaviors of those uh, those people and also help organizations put procedures and, and systems in place to be able to manage that risk and hopefully prevent that risk where possible. Uh, the way I got into this field was um, a little bit of a roundabout way, completely by accident. Uh, I was a uh, first year undergrad psychology student at the, the University of Queensland here in Australia. And uh, I was broke like every other first year university student. And uh, I was working three jobs at the time. <laughs> I was working as a, each one of these could be a tangent. Uh, I was working as a party DJ. I was working as a uh, drive through bottle shop attendant, so liquor store attendant. Uh, and I was working as an after hours body collector for a funeral home. Uh, so <laughs> it, was, it was an unusual collection of part-time jobs. And uh, I thought, you know, I need to find somewhere where I can, you know, uh, make a little bit more money in one place, uh, preferably without interacting with corpses and grieving relatives uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of marketable skills being 18 years old, but I, I did have the fact that I was, I was a big kid. I was six foot three and, you know, uh, 120 kilograms, so like 250 pounds or so. Uh, and I was on the Australian judo team at the time. And I thought, I wonder if I can get paid money to throw people out of nightclubs. And, uh, and turns out you can. And I did. Uh, so I, I expected to spend three months doing, working as a bouncer in local pubs. I ended up spending five years doing that. Uh, and it, it actually completely changed my, uh, my interest in psychology. Uh, originally, I was studying psychology because I wanted to work with athletes. I wanted to be a performance psychologist. But uh, as I got into this world of violence and, and aggression and, and real sort of the, the adrenal fight or flight and, and seeing people that were otherwise good people doing really dumb things uh, and... I just got really fascinated with this idea of why do people do what they do? And, and, uh, and I enjoyed protecting people. I enjoyed um, be, being the one that could, that could protect someone who was vulnerable. But I also, uh, as that evolved, I started training the girls who were working behind the bar about how to protect themselves and what to look for. And some of the signs that they're, you know, the guy they're talking to isn't, isn't good. And, uh, and I realized I had this passion for, for teaching on this subject. Uh, and as someone who is, I guess, a protector at heart, 
uh, I realized that uh, I, and I, I, I didn't just work as a bouncer. I worked as a bodyguard. I worked as, um, you know, various different security capacities over the next few years. But um, uh, I realized that you're never going to have the capacity to be able to assign everybody a protector. Right, you're never going to be able to have enough security guards and, and 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 quality security guards. You're never going to be able to have enough protectors in place to protect every vulnerable person. The only way to protect people at scale is to give them the skills to be able to do it themselves. Uh, and that became the the next evolution for me. Uh, I ended up working for a state health department as an aggressive behavior management instructor and an occupational violence prevention practitioner, which is a long business card. Uh, but that gave me an insight into all sorts of areas, uh, sort of fringe areas of aggression, like uh, geriatric and dementia health, traumatic brain injuries, um, substance abuse and withdrawal, uh, me acute mental illness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that gave me a really cool sort of rounded view of, of all the different human factors that can lead to aggression and violence. And uh, and yeah, that basically was the, the foundation of the rest of my career. I've spent the, the last 15 years now uh, consulting to all sorts of organizations in all sorts of industries from retail, hospitality, liquor, uh, venue management, uh, to banking and local, state and federal governments uh, about how to manage this risk of violence and aggression in the workplace. Oh, very interesting to see how you got into uh, what you do. I'm, I'm always uh, uh, interested in people's origins story, you know, like Marvel, Marvel uh, Universe here, you know, how you get there. It's really interesting sometimes. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Uh, look, it's a pleasure. And this is something that, that really is a passion subject for me. There's There's a bunch of other there's a bunch of other backstory we could dive into, but it is something I'm very passionate about is protecting people from, from the risk of violence and aggression, or even just the fear of violence and aggression. To be honest, like the fear of being harmed is, is sometimes more destructive than actually being harmed. So it's, it's about creating that perception of safety as much as it is creating real safety. Well, let's go dive into some of the things we were going to touch on today. Uh, sure. First of all, I, at the beginning, when I introduced you, I said workplace violence or um, occupational violence and aggression. Are they one and the same, or is there a difference? Because I, I think I understand occupational violence. That might be the work at home. I don't know. You can correct me. And aggression isn't necessarily, in, in my view, and I could be wrong again, and quite often I am, it could be uh, just an aggressive personality or behavior, not necessarily um, physical, physical harm. So can you explain what, what that is, occupational um, uh, violence and aggression? Sure. So, so I guess in practice, they're the same thing. Uh, okay. the, the most commonly used term is workplace violence internationally. Uh, the, the term occupational violence and aggression, to the best of my knowledge, uh, has been a term that was adopted in Australia uh, because of the perceived limitations of the phrase workplace violence in that with violence that is connected to someone's work does not always happen in a workplace. So, for oh, example, yeah, yeah. with our health and safety uh, infrastructure here, I mean, if, if an employee is injured on their way to or from work, there's still a workplace accident, even though it didn't happen at the workplace because it's part of their, their normal routine, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So um, applying the same logic, uh, calling something workplace violence, it led to sometimes an underreporting of incidents that happened outside of work. For example, someone walking to a car park, or perhaps somebody who was being harassed because they're in uniform outside of outside of uh, hours, uh, those kinds of things were perhaps uh, it created a confusion about whether that's workplace violence or not. And the second piece of violence, I mean, uh, the actual definition of violence does does cover aggression, but there is a perception that violence has to be physical. So therefore, the violence and aggression was put in to cover any sort of threatening or inappropriate behaviors. So. Um, I think in practice, they're basically the same. Just OVA, occupational violence and aggression, is currently more widespread in Australia and workplace violence is more commonly used everywhere else. So define the aggression part. What is, because I, I, like I said, I don't think aggression has to be physical harm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I mean, it can cover anything from uh, abusive behavior, threatening behavior, um, yeah, taunts, insults, and anything along those lines that you, in, in the verbal context, intimidating or threatening behaviors in terms of making gestures, um, depriving someone of personal space, making inappropriate comments, uh, that, that sort of <clears throat> passive aggressiveness. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go into what is quote unquote aggression, but basically if it makes the, makes the uh, receiving party feel unsafe, typically that's considered to be uh, aggression 
but uh, but you, to your to your point, there is a healthy aggression. There's absolutely there's absolutely ways that you can be aggressive with where there's no harm intended. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, in this context, it's yeah, it just sort of is a catch all for any of those sort of antisocial behaviors that make someone feel unsafe. So I assume harassment then also comes absolutely. into play. You know, either calling somebody at work or leaving messages on their desk or whatever the case that kind of falls under absolutely. that heading as well, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So what's the biggest misconception about um, OVA? I'm going to start using that uh, acronym. <laughs> yeah, but by all means, feel free to use workplace violence with an international audience. It'll make more sense. Uh, okay. But uh, and, and to be honest, half the time I introduce what I'm talking about as OVA and then I switch to workplace violence because it makes makes sense to more people. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, I think the, probably the, the biggest misconception is that it's a security problem. And, uh, and a lot of the treatments for, for workplace violence over the years have been very focused on security, uh, as opposed to an integrated set of solutions that incorporate areas such as, well, you've got your security division, but you've also got occupational health and safety or workplace health and safety. You've got your human resources component. You've got a learning and development component. You've got a business continuity component. There's a, there's a lot of different pieces of, a puzzle, of the puzzle that actually go into preventing and managing workplace violence. And when we assign it as a security function, uh, we end up with a very, I guess, immature set of solutions. And that's not, not a criticism of security. It's just we, they're limited by their own budget, their own expertise. And as we know, security is often, in, my, in a lot of industries, security is, is very poorly funded. So you end up with people that are well-intentioned but don't have resources or expertise to be able to manage a very complex risk. Mm-hmm. So I think probably the, the biggest misconception is that it's something we can control with, with guards, gates, and panic buttons. Uh, and... It really has to go beyond that. It, it can't be purely reactive. We have to have proactive measures in place. We need to treat this as the tr- strategic risk that it is and not just a yeah, something we need to throw a Band-Aid on. Well, it's interesting because you've touched on a couple of the questions that I wrote down here that uh, isn't on our outline. And you mentioned HR, uh, security, business continuity, uh, health and safety. Who owns this then? Well, this is the biggest problem because no one owns it. <laughs> Right. Everybody really? owns okay. it. Everybody owns it. Everyone has a piece that has a responsibility, and and who actually owns this risk in terms of who who is responsible for treating it? Uh, it varies from industry to industry and company to company, and and that is part of the reason why, in my in my belief and in, in my experience, it hasn't been handled well in most industries because it's it's there's there's no uh, there's no real accepted best practice model. Uh, there's no guidelines. There's no legislation that says this is exactly how you must handle it. Just as you must handle it, right? So you end up with people that uh, usually end up with a champion who who wants to do something good and they know it's a problem, but they have limited expertise. And maybe that person comes from a HR background, and all their solution is going to be HR focused. Or most commonly, it's a security manager, a CSO, for example, that might really be, be passionate about it. And all their solutions are security focused, not just because that's what they know, but also because that's what they can control. And, that, and that's what they can then you know, put into place and get funding for, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard for a security manager to say, we need, a, we need an overhaul of our HR system, right? That no one's going to listen to that person. Yeah. So uh, because there's, this ownership seems to be at the lower levels of the organization, oftentimes nothing gets done. Oh, nothing, nothing substantial gets done. It ends up being a, a tick box compliance based approach, as I'm sure Gav has spoken to you about um, this whole idea of ticking a box and saying, yes, we've addressed the risk that will hold up in a coroner's court. We're good. Right. And because it's, it's hard to make organizational change uh, and we'll get into what, what a best practice model should look like. But yeah. uh, to, to be honest, like the, the ownership really has to sit with the ultimate risk owners. It needs to be executive leadership team and board. Uh, they're the ones that own the risk. They're in, in under Australian law. Those are the ones that might be going to jail, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, they need to have ownership of this risk the same as they would any other. Yeah. Canada has some of the same thing, you know, the same law, you know, it's the, the upper levels that could be going to jail, you know, uh, losing their jobs and, you know, basically their lives are going to fall apart. Uh, is it that if leadership is the quote unquote owner, then does that mean that um, everybody has to play a part? Like everyone needs to be involved. There can't be a silo who just looks after A, B, and C, and somebody else looks after D, E, and F. They've all got to work together. Because I'm thinking if there is some sort of an uh, incident of any kind, that crisis management and crisis communications, 
would have to get involved in your social media teams. So it, it seems almost like it's a business continuity type thing as well, or resilience. Everyone's got to have a, a part to play and they've all got to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I'm, on, I'm in two fences about silos, right? We always talk about silo busting. Everyone wants to break down the silos, but my question is always, well, why were the silos there in the first place? Because if no one likes silos, then why do we build them? Uh, and at the end of the day, they're good for setting parameters of what someone's responsibility and what's, you know, we don't want to duplicate work. We don't want to have uh, unnecessary redundancy or unuseful redundancy. But at the same time, uh, there has to be a level of interoperability and, and, and communication between those silos. So it's fine for your security guards or your security team to focus on access control, for example. Uh, if they're issuing the access passes and they're, they're monitoring that, but they still need to talk to HR when someone gets fired or someone, someone has... Uh, is is acting suspiciously and needs their pass cancelled or needs access restricted. Like there still needs to be that communication between the two, yeah. and and this is where I often see for uh, failings um, or, or vulnerabilities, I guess, with, with some of our clients is that they have really mature systems that don't talk to each other. So you you might have a really good security infrastructure and you've got a really good HR infrastructure, but someone got fired two weeks ago and security weren't told to cancel the pass. Right, that, those kinds of things create massive vulnerability when it comes to insider threats. Uh, right. And uh, that's just that breakdown of communication. But you're absolutely right. After an incident, we need to have our, our, our communications teams stand, stood up. We need to be looking for, we need to be prowling social media for footage of this incident and, and controlling or, or removing it where appropriate. Uh, we, need to be, we need to be on the front foot about controlling the narrative about what happened. Uh, but then we also need to make sure that what our communications team are, are saying is accurate. And we can action it because we don't want to make a, a comment and, and say we're going to start, we're going to do this, this, and this to, to try and control this risk. And then six months later, someone comes back and a journalist sniffs around and says, okay, you've done nothing. So there has to be communication uh, between all the different parts. I don't think it's a completely every, it's free for all, uh, but I think it's it's important that we have a command and control structure in place so that, uh, so that all parties know what their job is and they talk to each other. Well, I like what you said uh, earlier about the tick box. Uh, if, if everybody is in their silo, then everyone gets their tick box because they, you know, we've done our part, but they never really talk to each other to really bring it all together. It's like everyone's got done their little piece of the puzzle. Someone's done their farmhouse, someone's done their duck, someone's done the lake, um, but the pieces never come together. So you never actually see what that final um, product or, or uh, outlook should be. Absolutely. And, and look, if, if we think about project management as an example, right, you still need to have a project manager. You need to have someone who is overall in charge. You can assign certain tasks to specialists and that you absolutely you should. But someone has to be in, in charge of collecting those deliverables and, and connecting them in a way that and making sure that that actually achieves the purpose rather than just saying everyone was busy. Right? We, we know there's a difference between everyone being busy and everyone doing something versus actually solving a problem. So it's important that someone is in charge of that. Uh, I'm a big supporter of someone in the ELT or board level, but, but anyone is seeing you in the organization really taking ownership of the workplace violence issue and driving that change across all the different areas of the business. Yeah, getting the, bring them all together. I, I remember working in one place uh, many, many years ago when I was still a full-time employee, when someone uh, was either onboarded um, or you know, left or fired or for whatever reason, they uh, had this big long checklist and all they did was enter in a system that so-and-so was no longer there. And it generated all these action report, not action reports, sorry, but actions for various groups, including myself, uh, who managed the offsite access to the disaster recovery site. You know, and, and even if, you know, we only had a small number of people who could get there, but it didn't matter out of 1500 people, I still got that and I had to confirm that that person has now been taken off the list doesn't have access, their code's not going to work, they can't show up there. And all these 20, 25 groups had to make go through that and make sure that it was taken care of. That was how they used to address one of the pieces that you brought, you know, and, and it was so that something couldn't happen in that respect, for, at least from the security side of things. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, I mean, sometimes those systems get a little bit uh, onerous and and unfortunately as you well, as, as you'd be well aware like you can create the world's best system but if it's too difficult to use or people don't like using it because it takes too much too long or it's complicated or it's just a pain in the butt yeah. to do like it doesn't matter how good your system is if the human beings aren't going to do it so we yeah. we have to find that happy medium yeah and ultimately you know you're protecting the lives of everyone in your facility and, Absolutely. and not just in but potentially outside as well right for sure for sure. Because that covers the aggression part, you know, uh, and you 
brought up a few examples in the beginning where someone might be in uniform having their company logo on their breast here and all of a sudden they're being harassed you know absolutely yeah it's uh and and look the, those kinds of pieces are it, it is so important that we we have robust systems uh, and that is the, the first component of what, what we put together in our in our uh, best practice model but um, but then it's the accountability and the actions on those systems and and mm-hmm. moving forward is in a risk intelligent way rather than just saying well we've got a good system we wrote a good policy we have a zero tolerance statement we're good like well what's, what's a zero tolerance statement if you don't put anything in place to change what's actually happening you right. just uh, you have a nice media release and that's it yeah and what does zero tolerance really mean yeah most people don't understand what tolerance <clears throat> even means right <laughs> zero zero tolerance means if, if one of our employees gets spit on at work then that means the whole organization collapses that would mean we have zero tolerance what we might what we more accurately saying is we have zero appetite right we have zero appetite for this to happen but yeah anyway that is, we, we, we could go on a big tangent about appetite and tolerance statements but we, <laughs> we'll stay no, the topic I, I, no i'm glad you brought that up because the uh, I always hear that uh, from a lot of uh, people, you know, friends and colleagues. Uh, you know, yeah, work we have a zero tolerance, but you still run into managers who were, you know, she shouldn't be in her position or he shouldn't be in that position because of the way they talk to people. Well, if you really did have that zero sure. tolerance, you know, that they're always showing aggressive uh, aggressiveness towards their their team members or you know trying to muscle in and get their way on things. Well, that's not yeah clear, clearly you have tolerance policy right yeah yeah clearly you have tolerance yeah right? because exactly. because we're seeing evidence of it and and i don't think zero tolerance or uh, you know towards zero or any of those sort of catchphrases about uh, health and safety for example i i don't think they're they're helpful usually because it makes any anything that breaches zero seem like a failure and if you've gone from having 300 incidents last year to 150 incidents this year that should be celebrated not feel like a failure because we didn't hit zero Right, it's it's something that we we need to keep in perspective, uh, and every organization is going to have its own risk. Like if if we are customer facing, for example, and you're dealing with a diverse population, and you're dealing with people from all sorts of walks of life, you are going to have some people that come in angry or aggressive or under the influence of substances, and it, it just then it's it's not just about zero tolerance; it's about harm minimization. Like how how do we firstly try to keep these people away uh, so they don't come in when they're volatile. But secondly, how do we how do we manage that once they're there in, in such a way that we minimize harm both to our staff, but also to other other customers or visitors or bystanders or whoever's around? Um, so I think it's it's important that we're realistic about this, and it's it's a difficult conversation to have because a lot of organisations don't want to accept that they have a tolerance for their staff being assaulted, but they do. Yeah. Right? They they do. They absolutely do. Because if they didn't, I mean, you know, you know, the easiest way for a hospital to stop having nurses assaulted, stop seeing patients, right? Yeah, that's obviously not <laughs> so, going to happen. So clearly there's a tolerance, right? Because we know that you know, nurses get assaulted, the most yeah. second most assaulted profession in the world. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And, and, and the most caring profession, arguably the most caring profession in the world. Uh, so we clearly have a tolerance for it. So no, no zero tolerance statement is going to confuse a nurse that, they, that it's not going to happen anymore. Well, now you got me thinking of something else. I know where you are down in Australia, you're in lockdown. Up yes. in Canada, we're coming out of our lockdown. Um, which who knows, maybe in another one, considering yep. that we're in area, lockdown but, six at the moment, just yeah. so, FYI, this is our sixth lockdown. So uh, uh, we'll, enjoy we'll, your freedom we'll while it lasts. I think we'll be into our fourth if we, if we move, if things keep continue the way they're going. Hmm. However, in many places, they're now starting to have people come back to the office. Mm-hmm. And we're hearing stories on people on airplanes, um, sometimes in offices now that, COVID has made people uh, either angry or more aggressive. And we're hearing a lot of these stories now of that aggression and anger coming out. Do you have any thoughts on, on that right now? Yeah. I mean, it's something we've kept a very close eye on here because uh, it's impacted a lot of our clients. I mean, we, we, we have clients in, in aviation, we have clients in public transport, we have clients in, in uh, human services and support services. Um, my my theory on this, and and this is purely my my own personal theory, uh, is that you know, I'll see if I can use my hands on the screen here. Uh, but uh, but basically, if we consider that everyone's breaking point is like here, and their normal baseline stress level is like here, what happens with COVID is that baseline stress level, that residual stress, gets a lot closer to the breaking point. So everyone's walking around just with this higher level of stress than what they normally would, and we don't detect it because it's not past the break breaking point, right? So we, everyone's just walking around just a little bit more stressed. Okay? It's like the like the uh, 
for any any new parents, right? That that like in, intense sleep deprivation, right? Where no one can tell that you're actually at your breaking point, but you are literally just a fraction below your breaking point. So mm-hmm. what, what happens is we've got a whole society that are now at a higher residual stress level, and any minor thing that would normally be a sigh or an eye roll or a just I need to catch my tongue before I say something now is a breakthrough moment where we're actually seeing a, yeah manifest in a in verbal abuse or a tirade or even physical assault so mm-hmm. I think it's just that COVID as a whole I mean this the pandemic is stressful the restrictions are stressful the uncertainty is stressful uh, all of that weighs on people in different ways and we've all been affected in different ways I've been fortunate that I've been able to stay fully employed the whole time. I've been working from home. I've got four kids at home. It's not ideal, but it's something that I've, you know, I haven't been financially that adversely impacted by it. Right? Whereas someone who's lost their job, lost their business, they're going to have a much higher level of, of, uh, of stress about this whole situation. Right. So unfortunately, where that gets directed is whoever ticks them off, right? It might be, I, I don't know if you had the same in Canada, but we, we introduced purchase limits to prevent panic buying. So it might be the 17 year old kid who's telling them they can't buy three bottles of milk. They can only buy two, right? Like it, yeah. that, that 17 year old kid is going to get a, a whole spray of abuse that has nothing to do with milk, right? It has to do with the overall stress of the, of the situation. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're seeing. And I think a lot of customer facing industries are experiencing that, but we're also seeing that with into employee relationships uh, where um, yeah, again, everybody's stressed. You know, someone who has just been working from home or perhaps in a, um, yeah, a, a less than, than healthy relationship and has been with their spouse or with their partner for a long period of time, they might be under a higher level of stress now. That's not even getting into domestic violence. Um, so when they come back into the workplace, they might be a different person. It, it's like dealing with people that have been through a trauma. They may be different when they come back. And it's something we have to be very mindful of when it comes to how we, in, how we in, reintegrate people into the, into the office, because not everyone is going to be the same person they were when they left. And a lot of the time, a lot of our a lot of our clients, they've hired people that have never worked in the office before. So we have no idea how they socially interact with other people because uh, they've just been working from home the entire time. So that's a, that's a that's something we normally catch in the probation phase, <laughs> okay, where yeah, you put someone yeah. on three months in, you kind of have an idea about whether they're antisocial and a team player or not. Now, hey, they're fully employed. You got to deal with it. So there's there's all sorts of really interesting layers to that. Yeah, I, I, as you were talking, I, I couldn't help but think because I had just read a headline, you know, about uh, flight attendants attacked, you know, again. So I had to get your opinion on what you thought of uh, with some of this reopening and people going back to work. So now yeah. we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to actually take a look at that model Joe talked about, and he's going to walk us through. We're talking with Joe Saunders today about workplace violence. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Today, we are talking with Joe Saunders, and we're talking about workplace violence. Joe, in the first segment, you talked about um, the model that uh, you utilize. And for viewers, you should be able to see that on your screen right now. Can you walk us through this? I don't know where where you want to start here. I'm not sure if it starts at the two big red leadership and culture parts or <laughs> where it really starts. But can you walk us through this? Absolutely. So, so let's just uh, we'll start at the top. Uh, so, leadership. Uh, I think when it comes to any complex risk, it, it, it begins with leadership, right? Unless you have buy-in from your from your leadership, then you're going to be limited in what you can really achieve. Um, and as we as we'll get into, I mean, that workplace violence is a complex problem. It's going to require interoperability. It's going to require intercon- uh, interconnected entities, integrated solutions. It's going to require a lot of coordination. So that means that someone has someone in a leadership role has to really buy into this. And it's also important that we. We have that accountability from our leaders to to really push this and to take ownership of it. So, so leadership is the most important thing. Someone has to drive this, and and, and if if, the, if no one's driving it, oh, the, it's not going to go very far. So that's the first and foremost thing. Uh, then we'll get we'll just get into the uh, the cycle of, of different elements of control, and these are in no real particular order. They're they're all important, and depending on the organization, they'll be weighted in different ways depending on their exposures, the maturity, and and how they do certain things, but We'll, we'll go through them in the order there on the screen. Okay. So the first thing is systems, policies, procedures, and governance. So we, we need to have policy on, on how we address certain things. You know, what's our hiring policy? What's our background check policy? What's our internal bullying and harassment policy? What's our social media policy? 
the, these are these are things we need to have written. Um, and and while this is like that compliance level thinking, uh, as I'm sure if you've listened to, to Dr. Gav speak, I mean, compliance is the first building block. That's the cost of entry. You need to make sure you have your compliance taken care of before you can start thinking about resilience or pre-resilience, as, as Gav would say. So uh, the first thing is, do we have those policies developed? Are they mature? Are they robust? Are they are they fit for purpose or are they just something we copied and pasted off a template we found online? Okay. <laughs> or, or or our HR person came from another company and took their policies with them. That happens way 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 more frequently than people think. Uh, so to the to the point where I've read policies in the past where it's got the wrong company name referenced. You know, like, hmm, yeah, I, I, I've come across business continuity plans like that where you Absolutely, see the, right? the current company logo everywhere and you see it and then somewhere buried under this big long paragraph. It's yep. the old company name. It, it makes me wonder whether it was someone internal that took the old IP or whether it was a consultant who just used a template. Uh, but yeah. anyway, that's that's a that's a separate thing. So that's the first level. Do we have systems in place that that outline uh, our policy, our procedure, our governance, how we're going to actually respond to the various elements of workplace violence, uh, or how do we prevent them? I guess. Uh, then we look at accountability. So it's fine to have the policy, procedure, and governance, but who's being held accountable for? breaches in this, right? If we have a HR policy that says we're going to background check every employee, but we're not doing it, whose fault is that? And and what happens? How, how do we detect that? Okay, so how do we detect that these things aren't happening before someone shoots up a workplace? Okay, um, like how, how do we how do we discover this stuff before an incident happens? And who is held accountable and what are the penalties for that? And it, and it shouldn't often, as we know, you know blame rolls downhill. Right. There, there needs to be a level of accountability at all levels for those kinds of breaches, because if, we, if we've gone to the effort of creating these policies and procedures, we're saying they're important. So who's monitoring them? Uh, who's, who's making sure this stuff actually happens? And accountability uh, is different than responsibility. I may, have, I may be responsible to do something, but somebody else is accountable to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Absolutely. Uh, who, who owns the risk? Yeah. Uh, that's, who, who owns this responsibility? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the accountability piece. If we're doing those two things well, okay, we, we, we're starting to have, starting to establish some sort of foundation. Uh, then we look at a mentally healthy workplace. So before we even get into customers or yeah, like we, we can we can go into all sorts of areas of workplace violence. We've got the current and former employees, your customers, clients, visitors, vendors, contractors, domestic violence or family and personal connections of employees, your issue motivated groups, terrorism even competitive sabotaging business. Like there's all these different outside elements that, um, that we, we might have to de- defend our, our organization against. But if we are not creating a mentally healthy workplace, all of those other pieces get, get compromised. So are we treating our people well? Are we looking after their stress levels? Uh, if we have a culture that overworks people, that destroys people's sense of self-worth, where they don't feel appreciated, where we have you know, a quote unquote toxic work environment, yeah. Firstly, you are not going to get the best out of your people. So that means there's going to be breaches. There's going to be shortcuts. There's going to be yeah, a lack of accountability. Uh, there's going to be people that will, ha- will harbor resentment towards their employer. Okay? And that, that's what can lead to you know, the, the inside actor or the insider threat uh, situation where we have someone who you know, has been with a company for 28 years and now suddenly they're, they're going on a rampage. Uh, yeah. it's, it's often because they've been ground down to the nub when it comes to their, their, their mental resilience and their, their self-esteem, and this feels like the way out for them. Uh, and that's usually because the, there hasn't been a mentally healthy workplace uh, created. Now, uh, it's, not just about, uh, it's not just about beanbags and, and pool tables, right? It's, it, <laughs> it's about looking after people's quality of life. What's their expectation of work-life balance? Uh, do we allow people creative freedom uh, where possible? Do we allow them to work on projects that are interesting to them? Uh, there's all sorts of pieces of creating a mentally healthy workplace that we should look into. Uh, do we encourage them? Do we yeah, do we mention anything if someone's sending emails at two o'clock at two, two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, right? If that's not if that's part of our culture, fine. But where's the balance point? Okay, that's so a, all these that's a big piece. Uh, I, yeah. I've even experienced that where someone will send an email at nine, ten, eleven p.m. or later. And the very first thing out of their mouth in the morning is, did you see my email last night? And yeah. they get upset that you didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's fine if you want to have flexible working hours, especially in this day and age. Like, there, there are going to be people that would prefer to work in the early hours of the morning because that's when the kids are sleeping or whatever, right? But there needs to be a, a cultural balance point there to say, it's fine if you want to do that, but you need to work within other people's parameters of when they're going to actually review that, respond to that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also, if you notice someone is sending, sending a, a emails at, at you know, 7 o'clock in the morning and again at 11 p.m. at night and they never seem to be off, who's checking in on them to make sure they're okay? Uh, because 
Yeah, especially in a, in a remote working environment, it's very easy to work seven days a week and not notice. Uh, so we need to be looking after our people. And, and that's not just about keeping uh, uh, people that may have undisclosed psychological issues or psychiatric issues or undiagnosed issues um, you know, stable. It's also about keeping our, our, our top performers, our healthy people strong. So uh, if we can do those things and we, we tick a lot of boxes that aren't just workplace violence related. Uh, then we look at the next step is, is risk-informed training systems. Uh, so I, 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 I very specifically called it risk-informed training systems because too often I see organizations that do a one-size-fits-all training solution. Like they might do security awareness. Okay, cool. That's excellent. I mean, if you want to do security awareness, that's uh, I will never say that's a bad thing to do. But it should be. Uh, maybe that's going to be your baseline that everyone does. But then let's have a look at what's everyone's security uh, exposure. What's their posture? What's their... What, what do they actually need to know for their role? And maybe there needs to be dedicated training for certain elements of the company. Um, verbal de-escalation training or conflict management training. That's a good coverall for everybody, but it's going to be different for someone who is in a customer service role versus someone who's in a HR role. Mm -hmm. uh, because someone in customer service is going to be dealing predominantly with customers. Someone in HR might be dealing with disciplinary issues. They might be dealing with firing someone. Uh, there's going to be a lot more nuance required for certain positions. So are we being risk-informed about what what is the risk that this person faces? Uh, what, what is the exposure they have? And what training do they need to operate safely? Mm -hmm. and so if we're, if we're taking our executive team, you know, this feels like forever ago, but if we're taking our executive team to uh, foreign countries, for example, for symposiums or, or conferences or events, uh, are we providing them any sort of travel safety training? Uh, mm. uh, or are we, are we just sort of saying, oh, they'll be fine, they're, they're well-traveled, they'll be all right. Uh, so risk-informed training systems is important. Um, the there's next, one I just want to point out a lot of times uh, I, I've come across where uh, reception sometimes gets mm. forgotten about. You know, they they see almost everybody that comes through the front door. And yet it's just all it is is a little barrier that has a phone or a plant sitting on it. And that's their protection. Yeah. So what, yeah. They, they tend to get forgotten about. You know, we, we tend to look at. Um, you know, every, anyone getting in from uh, other sources or people that are already in the building, but that reception uh, individual is right there on the front line. Yeah, and one of, one of the areas that I'm really passionate about with in this field is that I find that it's, it's often the lowest paid employees that are exposed to the most violence and aggression. Uh, so our retail workers, our hospitality workers, our fast food workers, yeah, they, they're usually the youngest, they're usually the lowest paid, and they're usually the most vulnerable. Uh, and and what is a, is a real passion for me is, or what, what kind of concerns me is that you have a, the whole, the next generation of workers being exposed to traumatic events and no one cares, no one's, no one's protecting them, no one's training them, no one's counseling them after an incident. So what impact does that have on our future? If our, like we, if someone's now traumatized and doesn't want to work in a customer-facing environment anymore, what impact does that have long-term on, on an organization that's going to hire that person in the future, right? So we really need to look after those younger and vulnerable people. And, and to your point, I mean, receptionists, not always, young, not always the youngest member of the team. Sometimes they are, uh, but oftentimes they get forgotten because they're the lowest paid, seemingly less important. But uh, if, if anyone says less in, a receptionist is less important, they've never operated in an office when the receptionist is off sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so true. Uh, yeah, uh, they, I I, uh, I remember being seconded into a admin support role once uh, at, a, at an organization, and it was the lowest paid gig I had in a while, and it was by far the most stressful. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, but uh, but yeah, absolutely understanding what risk each member of your team faces and providing them training that that is appropriate to that risk. And and that's not to say that if you have a ten person organization that you need to provide everyone 10 different training courses. It might be that one or two courses is enough for everybody, uh, but let's just be realistic and do a real risk assessment on what they need. Right. Uh, then we move on to integrated security and safety controls. Okay, so this is where our, our traditional sort of uh, workplace violence controls come in, like your, your duress buttons, access control, gates, security guards, um, your, uh, your environmental layout. Okay, so what, what's the like, traffic flow, egress, um, uh, so access and egress. CCTV coverage, all those kinds of pieces, like that, that's where that falls. And again, it, it's going to be very dependent upon what is the nature of this organization? What's the, you know, what do we need to be watching? Uh, all those kinds of bits and pieces. So they need to be integrated in that they need to talk to each other, right? There's no point saying we're going to, we're going to roll out duress buttons, duress pendants for everybody. 
you know, we're going to, our staff are all going to wear duress pendants or panic buttons around their neck. And it's happened more than once. I've said, what happens when you press the button? And there's just been dead air because like, oh, we'll, 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 it sets off an alarm. Okay, what happens when the alarm goes off? <clears throat> uh, we, we all run? Okay, what happens when you get there? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's no training solution about how to actually manage this incident. We're just going to run everybody towards the bad thing. <laughs> and, and hopefully the overwhelming mass of people will be enough to make the bad thing go away. Uh, that's... Um, yeah, that's that's not an integrated solution, right? That's that's what happens when you just buy a piece of technology and say, we've got duress watches now. They're super cool. They're fun to play with. They even have snake on them. And and, and that's basically the end of the conversation. Uh, yeah. But we need to have integrate. It needs to integrate with all these other pieces uh, to, to make it actually effective. Um, same with CCTV. You can put cameras in, but if no one's watching them, all they are is an investigative tool. Uh, uh, Maybe a deterrent if they're, if they're overt. Uh, but, uh, but we really need to start thinking about how these treatments interact with each other uh, and create an overall safer environment. Um, moving on from there, we, we then have intelligence. Okay, so th this is uh, our threat assessment or threat, threat monitoring, threat managing uh, component. Who's, who's watching the people that might want to do us harm? Okay, every organization has people that may wish to do them harm, whether it's a recently terminated employee, whether it's an issue motivated group that might take issue with your industry or something that's happened in the press. Uh, who is actually responsible for monitoring those people, monitoring those groups? What are they posting on social media? What's the activity that's coming through in our networks, right? It's, uh, I work a lot with religious uh, institutions, right? Whenever there's a, a high profile um, yeah, a member of a faith that's up on charges for something, there is going to be an increase in threats and harassment towards all, all organizations in that faith. Uh, so who's watching that to make sure it's not being targeted at us? Who's reporting this stuff? There, there has to be, a dedicated person and and yeah sometimes that will fall within your security team's jurisdiction but there it's a specific thing a spe sorry a specific thing to know how to manage a, a threat and to be able to observe that threat and decide when it's time to act upon that threat uh that is a dedicated function that has to interact with everything else uh and then we have a uh, incident response capability so uh, to my point about duress buttons what is our capability to respond to an incident uh, we all do fire drills uh, some places, uh, especially in the US, might do active shooter drills. Uh, we might have lockdowns. We might have, uh, in Australia, sometimes called code gray and code black drills, uh, where it's shelter in place or it's evacuate. But what's our actual capability? Do we have security guards that can respond to things? Are they armed or unarmed? Uh, do we have uh, even even something like, uh, to me, uh, bodyguarding, executive protection? That, that's actually part of workplace violence prevention. So do we, do we have our executive team with some sort of residential security in their homes? Or do we have them with, uh, with, with protectors on, with them at all times, depending on the, the client? Sometimes this is the case, sometimes it's not. But uh, what is our response capability? And, and that includes things like uh, what's our relationship with local authorities? Uh, what's the mm. response time for police mm. if they need to get here? Do they know the layout of our building? If they had to clear this building, would they know how to, how to move around in it? Because we've actively engaged with them. We've brought them in. We've involved them in exercises. Do you, uh, the, do you have in Australia, because you just brought up an interesting point, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if you have it in Australia, but most buildings, I think it's actually law here in Canada, that any kind of an office building has to have a, um, uh, a container on the wall that, care, that has the plans to the building inside. Uh, most of the time, it's called a fire fire plan but police can use it et cetera, et cetera. yeah um, we, in case there's do, yeah. they they know the layout of the building they know how to get around do they do you have that in australia as well yeah we, we do have floor plans uh that, that are like emergency exit diagrams that can be useful but it's a lot different to having been in a building and knowing the knowing how to how it moves and how it, like what the structure of the building is versus having to go and look at the plan first so uh, I, I highly encourage uh especially vulnerable organizations where they might need emergency response to invite police firefighters etc in to have to participate in their drills do an, do an evacuation drill with police observer, police observers or, or fire observers uh because it'll just give them just that little piece of familiarity of, of where you are where, what, where you're located where your access and egress points are okay and and just any sort of rapport and relationship building you can create with emergency services just may be useful in the future yeah um, i i remember going through uh, i worked in a building and they had a, an evacuation drill and assembly drill uh, once every quarter and one of the quarters you never knew which one but the fire department would be there on site with us watch check 
you us. know, and they would say, okay, last person, you sure about that? And they would go in and look and make sure. And often they would find somebody hiding, not wanting to participate. And they'd come down and say, you're doing it again. Yeah. And they, they would do it and they would just show up and do it and not tell you when. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that kind of accountability is, is useful for sure. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so, so really, that that last category, sorry, that that category of incident response is just what do we have when we have an incident? How do we respond to it? And it's not that it like a lot of organisations we work with, they don't have any security guards, they don't have a lot of incidents. So, how are we training our team to be able to respond safely to a threatening situation? And it could just be we're working at a, you know, a uh, uh, an electronics store, and we've got a person who's angry because they uh, can't return the product that they want to return. Uh, and and they're going to abuse our staff member. What's our response capability for that? What is our process for dealing with this to get everybody safe, and hopefully, yeah, the 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 angry person leaves, or alternatively, wait till the police arrive. So, what is our process for that? Um, but it's important we establish that beforehand. Would that also be to calm that angry customer down? The the reason yeah, why yeah, I, the reason why I ask is, yes, you want to make sure the staff is safe. I, that's obviously you know key. If part of your response is just to get that angry person out, well, then you've, you're, my view is you're not really solving that issue because that person is still angry. Yes. Now they have, there's an opportunity of them coming back, right? Absolutely. And, and, and look, you're just diverting the violence somewhere else. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, I, I, I encourage my clients de escalate wherever possible. But if at any stage it doesn't feel safe to de escalate, then at that point, your priority has to shift to safety of as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, giving people real de-escalation skills and we could do it, we could do a whole nother episode on de-escalation skills, but, um, but giving I'll people real de-escalation that. skills. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it is something that, uh, that is, is super important, especially for customer facing employees. But, uh, but yeah, there, there comes a line where, you know, it'd be nice to de-escalate you, but the most important thing is that no one gets knocked out or no one gets, yeah, no one gets seriously hurt here. Uh, and uh, if that just means that the bad guy has to leave and go somewhere else, then we hope everyone else has robust systems as well. Uh, but uh, it's it's just one of those things that we we have to sort of uh, do a risk assessment of a dynamic risk assessment of, in the moment. Uh, and then the last piece of the, of, of the circle is post incident investigation support and monitoring. Uh, so what are our what's our capability for being able to investigate this incident from a safety point of view, from a security point of view? Uh, were there failings in our systems? Were there failings in our preparedness? Or was it just one of those things that we just, you know, we did everything right, but it didn't work? In which case, can we do something better? Or can we change something that would have worked? Or is it something we're just going to chalk up to and go, you know what, that was a freak event. There's nothing we can realistically do to prevent that from happening. Here's how we're going to make sure that people are a little bit safer or a little bit more supported uh, next time it happens. Um, so it's in terms of way or another, finding something to change. To, to yeah, and, and and look, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there isn't anything to change. Sometimes the, the change would be cost prohibitive. It's just it's just not worth it for the frequency of and the severity of the incident. But as long as we have that conversation, as long as we've we've had an objective conversation and we've really looked at it, then we've made. I think that's our due diligence to to really look at every incident. And go, is there something we could have done differently? If not, okay, yeah, that's just it's a risk. We it's it's within our tolerance. We're okay with it. Yeah. Um, and, and but it's important that we have those conversations. Uh, one, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, and it's a little bit harsh, but uh, but I like it. Is that there's there's nothing wrong with making a mistake the first time, but the second time it's a choice. And and I think that uh, when it comes to these sorts of incidents, if the same sort of incident is happening over and over, have you actually looked at it and decided whether we're okay with this incident happening over and over? Because if you're not, you need to change something. If you are, that's okay. But make an intelligent choice about it, not just yeah, not just accept it because you haven't been bothered to look at it. Um, and, and then we've got support for persons that, are, that have been affected. Uh, so whether it's employee assistance programs, counseling, men, uh, mentoring, checking in on people after the fact, uh, mental health support, et cetera. Do we have those, those systems in place? And, and monitoring to make sure that any changes we made are, are being implemented. And that brings us to the, uh, the big outer circles. At all stages, whenever we're changing anything, whenever we're, uh, we're looking at, uh, at possible solutions, there needs to be communication and consultation across all stakeholders. And this is another reason why I can't just be driven by one department. Uh, if security change is something that impacts the, the effectiveness of the organization, then there's, there's probably not going to be buy-in. There's probably not going to be compliance. <laughs> for, for example, uh, one, one client uh, in, introduced uh, 
uh, access control at the gates, right? And that instead of waving people through whenever they appeared at the, the gate to the facility, they actually had to swipe their, their access card. Uh, and this change obviously was, was great from a security point of view, but it upset so many people that have been working there for 10 years and have never had to swipe their card. And they usually left their card on the desk at night. They didn't have it on them. And then they had to get someone to come in and vouch for them. And they're like, but I've worked here for 10 years. And it was this massive thing because there's no consultation or communication with the actual people that were affected by the change. Uh, well, that, so you bring up an interesting point then with part of this consultation, <clears throat> it's not just the leadership, like at the top here, or uh, division leads, you know, the vice president of finance or HR or security, whatever the case may be, but also talking with um, the the employee base themselves. What do w- would you approach them to find out what they expect, how they would, you know, like to see things, you know, not necessarily the training, but just consulting, you know, if this happened, what would you expect? What would you Absolutely. want to see, right? Would that Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and also when you, when you have to change something, sit them down and explain why you're changing it. Uh, this isn't just to make your life more difficult. Right. And, and a lot of times people see security controls and safety controls as just a barrier to be able to do what I need to do uh, because they don't have the context for what happens if it's not you, if it's someone else. Right. Uh, and sometimes it's better having that conversation and connecting them to their why, right? What's the why behind this? And, and does it fit with our company values? And sometimes I've had to sit people down and go, okay, it's fine for you to take the risk, but what if this was your daughter's first place of work or your son's first place of work? Would you want us to create a safer environment for them or do you want us to expose them to risk in the name of, of yeah, efficiency? Uh, and nearly always parents will go, we'll start to think about it a little bit differently. Uh, they Make might not acknowledge it. Make it's it personal, personal, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So but yeah, the, the post-incident phase is really about just supporting people, monitoring, making sure the changes have, have been put in place. Um, but so then we go into communication and consultation across all levels, across all aspects of the business. Whenever we change anything or we think we need to change something, we need to talk to people. We need to get uh, buy-in. Uh, and so people will accept change more readily when they've been asked their opinion. Even if they don't agree with it, if they're at least asked, they typically will comply better. <laughs> uh, it's when people are forced have a change forced upon them and they won't even ask their opinion that they tend to rebel against it. Okay. So uh, uh, communication and consultation is important. And then we've got the monitor, review and adjust. So this is, this is an ISO 31000 aligned model. If anyone's familiar with ISO 31000 risk management guidelines, this is aligned to, to that. Um, so we, we're always looking at monitoring the changes, reviewing them to make sure they're effective or make sure we haven't created any new risk with, with our changes or additional controls. And, uh, and adjusting where, where necessary. And this is a continual process. This, it has to be a continual living, breathing, adapting process to managing the risk because we don't always know all our risks until they occur. Right? We can do the best threat intelligence we, we have, but sometimes something will slip through and you're like, wow, I never thought of that. Uh, and then we've, got to, then we've got to look and go, what needs to be overhauled? What needs to be improved? What, what gaps can we fill? Uh, but that's, that's an ongoing process. And the last piece of the, the, the model is culture. All right? So the, the organizational culture, just like leadership, holds everything together. It, you can have all this stuff going well, right? But if you introduce, I'm going to go back to duress buttons again. If you introduce duress buttons or panic buttons under a reception counter, but then that person feels shamed if they press it. They're made to feel like they were a wuss because this is just normal business and that they, they shouldn't be reporting something or they shouldn't be pressing the button over that. He always did was raise his voice. Right. Well, that cultural issue is going to is going to undermine everything else, um, including reporting, for example. Right. If you have a culture where don't bother doing incident reports because no one pays attention to them or no one acts upon them or it's just going to be, take you offline and we need you to here to do this work. If you have if those are pieces of your culture, nothing else works. Yeah. Um, a, a question I ask about a mentally healthy workplaces and, and a culture of, of zero tolerance or, or zero appetite for violence is would your lowest paid worker feel comfortable calling out your CFO for inappropriate behavior in the workplace and, and not be in fear of their job? Oh, and I guaranteed very few would say, yeah, they feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and be, and be hundred percent confident. They're not going to get fired or disciplined in, in some sort of unofficial capacity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not many companies would fit that. And it's an extreme example, but if that is the case, there are some cultural issues we need to look at in terms of how, how people are expected to deal with violence, aggression, inappropriate behaviors, et cetera. Because if we really have zero tolerance, we need to have zero tolerance. Uh, so that's, uh, but that's, that's the model, right? That's the, that's the best practice model uh, to 
they they really I guess is the the holistic of I start calling it the holistic workplace violence prevention model uh, because it, it's more than guards gates and duress buttons. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of the show. <clears throat> Do you have any uh, final thoughts or a final comment you'd like to convey regarding workplace violence or um, occupational violence and aggression? Any final uh, things you'd like to uh, bring forward for anyone? Yeah, look, I, I think we've, we've painted a picture of this being a very complex challenge. Right? And not a lot of people out there would feel 100% comfortable with, with how to manage each of those elements on that model. And it might feel overwhelming. Uh, my encouragement is if you are passionate about this, if this is something that's in your portfolio, reach out to, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to, happy to connect you. I'm, I'm fortunate to have networks all over the world of people that, that do a good job of this. So uh, if you need guidance, reach out to somebody. Don't just get overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem and, and put it away. This is super important. It, it may save a life. It, it may save someone's mental health. It may save someone from a traumatic event that is going to yeah, change their relationship with their community or with their partners or with their kids. Like you don't know what the ramifications are of the incident you might be able to prevent if you do this well. Mm-hmm. So my encouragement is don't be overwhelmed. It's it's an it's an area of study that is evolving. It's growing. We're doing our best we can to educate as many people as we can. Uh, but if you do need assistance, please do reach out. Uh, as I said, anywhere in the world, I can probably connect you with somebody or we can help virtually since in this, in this very virtual interconnected world. So uh, that's, that's my encouragement. Uh, please take this as a serious threat, but also don't be overwhelmed by the complexity. Reach out for help. And the, the lives you were talking about, the impacts could be your own as well. Yeah, it could be your own. It could be, your, you know what? It's the, the number of, uh, yeah, the number of people I've, I've talked to, uh, at client organizations that have said they were, they're exposed to something and it changed the, even it changed the way they interacted with their kids. Right. And then they had massive regret because they were shorter with their kids or they had, yeah, they they developed a, a drinking problem as a result of uh, yeah. something that they experienced that was that was unmitigated, that wasn't uh, that wasn't treated appropriately, and that changed their relationship they had with their family. So we're talking about like long term effects here, not just you know uh, uh, someone someone got spat on or someone someone got you know, had some papers thrown at them. There can be very long term effects. Um, the, so the the other thing I'll, I'll just plug if you're interested in in more about managing violence I do run the Managing Violence podcast so it's uh you can find that at violencepod.com uh, so where I talk about as you'd imagine all things managing violence uh, but uh, but also from a professional point of view if you're looking for workplace violence prevention uh, help go to uh, www.risk the number two solution.com and uh, and we'll be able to help you out or find me on LinkedIn I'm I'm on very active on LinkedIn I'm happy to accept and talk to anybody. Well, great. Well, Joe, thanks very much for uh, coming on and talking about this. And I'm going to hold you to the uh, de-escalation part. I'll be reaching out to you about that. And uh, I think that would be a really interesting show as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, Happy to do it. I don't think anyone really talks about uh, that part a lot. They all talk about the prepared and response, but the actual right in the middle of an incident, that would be really interesting uh, to talk about. So I really appreciate you spending your time and expertise with us today. Thanks for reaching out. And thanks, Gav, for actually pointing out that uh, to talk to you. And check out uh, Joe's podcast, uh, violencepod.com. It's in the description uh, down below, so you can check it out. Uh, Otherwise, thanks, Joe, and everybody watching. Stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.